If you've ever wanted to use less energy, it's usually meant sacrificing comfort. You might decide to take the bus instead of drive, or you might set the thermostat so your AC and heat don't run so much. Some people do this, and that's great, but energy is really cheap. You know, we pay less than half the cost that many in Europe and Asia do, and lots of us are happy to trade a larger bill for more comfort. This is a cultural problem. Everyone made fun of poor President Carter for asking Americans to put on a sweater in the winter, but this runs deep in our culture. We don't like to give up comfort, even though we know the way that we use energy is causing cultural, environmental, and political problems. But it's more than just a cultural problem or a question of comfort. Carbon pollution is making cities hotter. And for increasing numbers of people, choosing to turn down the thermostat could have dire consequences. When that choice is made for us, even here in the US, because the power goes out, people die from being in buildings that get too hot or too cold. In 1995, a five-day heat wave killed 739 people in Chicago. And we know that in the future, it's likely heat waves will be more frequent and more severe. Now, here's where I'm going to veer off script, because talks that start like this usually go downhill really fast. <laughs> Even with all the bad news about climate, we still have cause to be optimistic. Now, when most people think about carbon pollution and climate change, they think about industrial processes. Factories belching smoke, cars stuck in traffic. But did you know that buildings are responsible for most carbon emissions? And in cities, buildings are responsible for half of all carbon emissions. And it's true that transportation and industry do emit carbon dioxide into our shared atmosphere, along with other pollutants. But it's buildings that are the big culprit. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this guy lied to us. He promised me optimism. And now he's sitting here saying that the building we're in right now is causing climate change. And that's true. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. We can design buildings that make more energy than they use. And when we do this, we get two things free. We get buildings that are healthier and more comfortable on a regular day. And we get buildings that, when the power goes out, maintain reasonable temperatures. So when the power goes out, as it will, even in the winter, we never again have to evacuate lower Manhattan. So here's why we can all be optimists. We have the technology and the materials we need to do this right now. It's simply a matter of shifting expectations. Now, some of you may have neighbors who live in houses that look like this. And some of you may even live in houses that look like this. Solar panels pretty much everywhere they'll fit. And this is great. But this approach won't work at scale. First of all, the solar panels on these houses don't generate enough power for heat. They're still heated with, uh, with natural gas, with fossil fuel. Second, not everybody lives in a single family house with this much roof area. And third, it's really difficult to store extra electric energy. Now, new battery technology will help with that, but it's expensive. And the other problem is that no matter how many solar panels we put on the roof, our houses are still uncomfortable. This house is in Maryland, and I used to live on the East Coast. Even when it's not snowing, it's really cold there. This is a typical American house. Our construction methods haven't really changed much in the last 50 years, so you probably have a pretty good sense of how uncomfortable this house is inside when it's very warm or very cold outside. So let's take a quick look at how it's built. We start with a wood frame. We cover that with sheet material into which we set doors and windows, and then we cover this with siding. And then we insulate from the inside and we build lots of these at the same time because we love mass production. Now, this is a challenge and an opportunity because at scale, even a small improvement can make a big difference. And to be clear, I'm talking about 
a big improvement. <laughs> now, let's imagine we're going camping in the wilderness for a week. Which cooler do you want to take? The one with lots of insulation and an airtight lid? Yeah, that's what I'd pick too. That approach works for buildings and it works for coolers. So let's take a look at how our existing buildings are built now. In this building, the heat is escaping through the roof. You can see that because it's melting all the frost. That's because the exterior of this building isn't covered with continuous insulation. And in the summer, it works in reverse. It's like you're living inside a giant radiator. So what happens is we end up with cold feet, and worse, we end up with mold inside our buildings because moisture condenses on cold surfaces. Now, how do we fix these problems? We're Americans. We like powerful things. <laughs> we go and buy the most powerful air conditioning or heating system we can find. And that works. There's just one problem. It's terribly uncomfortable. All of that forced air isn't just uncomfortable. It causes and aggravates health problems. Dry eyes, runny nose, sinus infections, allergies, asthma. And it wastes energy, too. Now, I don't know about you, but I like living in the future. I can talk to the internet. My car can park itself. And I feel a little offended that my house is making me sick and uncomfortable. And the thing is, we don't need to do things all that differently. We can still start with the same wood frame, but let's add continuous insulation. This little trick is hugely important in making the rest of the insulation do its job. Here's why. Imagine your house is a bucket. All the water inside the bucket is the energy you've spent to make your house warm or cool. A thicker bucket is a better bucket. Say that three times fast. It keeps everything inside at just the right temperature. But if your bucket has holes, no matter how thick it is, all the energy inside just leaks out. This is why we need to build with continuous insulation. If we don't, the heat is more than happy to move through those points of weakness. And this is also why we need to make our buildings airtight. This building is on fire. The builder is testing it to see where it leaks. Did you know that in most places in the US, it's legal to build a house that is so leaky in a slight breeze that the air inside is completely changed three times every hour? That means you are paying to heat or cool air that ends up in your neighbor's yard in 20 minutes. And many existing buildings are much, much more leaky than that. In a high performance building, windows are a point of weakness, so we wanna use really good ones. That means in most places, three panes of glass and always a compression seal, so the window seals shut. Double hung windows, sliding windows, and sliding glass doors leak a lot of air because there's no way to get them to stay fast in a wind. And now that we have a good building enclosure, we can heat and cool this entire building with super efficient mechanical systems and provide a continuous filtered stream of fresh air. And when we do this, we can provide all the power the house needs with relatively few solar panels. And if we put more on our houses, we can feed that energy back into the grid. And if we do that enough, we don't have to build as many power plants. All this, and not once, have you changed your thermostat. This approach is called passive building, and it's being developed here in the US by an organization called FIAS to meet the challenges of all the climates that we have, everything from the cold of Alaska to the heat of Texas, and everything in between. Okay, now I know that not everyone believes in climate change, and I know that some people don't give a rip about solar energy. But you know what no one likes? Bed bugs. <laughs> Funny thing is that when you build a building that's airtight, things bigger than an air molecule have a really hard time getting in there. 
So when you take this approach and apply it to each unit in an apartment building, you end up with units that are more comfortable, have very low bills, and are resistant to pests. Apartment building developers, especially those building for the affordable market, love this. And it's driving adoption of this approach in places like New York and Pennsylvania. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering what this costs. And if you're building a single family house, it costs more, typically. But if you're building a larger building, and this is your goal from the outset, you can achieve a passive building at little to no added cost. And this is especially true compared to checklist approaches such as LEED that encourage a piecemeal approach. Passive building works for apartment buildings in New York City, for dental clinics in Virginia, modernist houses in Washington State, craftsman bungalows in California, and with just about any kind of architectural style you can imagine. As a professor and chair of the Sustainable Market Transformation Program, I'm doing my part to equip the next generation of architects and builders with the skills they need to realize net zero energy passive buildings. And in return, I'm asking you to do your part. I'm asking you to demand less. Now you know it's possible. So the next time you hear somebody's building a new house or your company starts the process for a new building, demand less. Demand less air leakage because you are going to end up with a more comfortable building with a healthier indoor environment. Demand less energy use because you are going to be part of the solution to climate change. And demand less because you know that a net zero energy passive building is readily available today at little to no added cost. We all deserve this. Demand drives market transformation. We can all start by demanding better buildings today. Thank you.